If you would like to support the channel, then please turn off adblock and refresh the page. Alternatively, use the link in the description below to donate to T1 Patreon. Thank you. Hello Magic Community on YouTube, I'm T1 Glistenrolf. December 29th, probably yesterday by the time this gets published, Seth Manfield posted an article uh, on TCG Player, so link in the doobly-doo, go and check it out. Uh, before you watch this, go stop, I'll pause it, pause the video, read the article if you'd like. It's called Five Modern Cards to Unban in 2017. You know this is going to be controversial, and Reddit jumped on it just a little bit. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, it made some suggestions that, while I understand where he's coming from, I disagree. I disagree with his rationale and the conclusion, but I'm not just going to leave it at that. I'd like to explain why. So he gives five cards, of course, uh, that he thinks should be unbanned if for no other... I mean, he starts off, you know, saying, I'm excited for the new year, but the last thing we want to happen is a format getting stale. So modern, I think, is pretty well balanced at this point, and he seems to mostly agree. Obviously, we can have a little bit of leeway, a little disagreement there, but that's fine. But for the most part, it's pretty balanced. That being the case, you can unban something and shake it up a bit. Hopefully, you won't make that big a splash. Uh, Wild Nacatl, Bitter Blossom, Ancestral Vision, Sword of the Meek. These didn't exactly break the world. They didn't break the game. Golgari Grave Troll, maybe, but even then, not initially. So, here are his suggestions for cards that might, or hopefully anyway, will have the same effect. We're going to start off with Jace the Mind Sculptor. And by the way, after all of this, I'll talk about one that he would like to be banned. Uh, so, spoiler alert. Jace the Mind Sculptor. Actually, no, let's move on. We'll, we'll get to Jace in just a sec. Because I think that it's easiest to start off with the next one partially because it's the one that I most strongly disagree, and partially because it relates to Jace the Mind Sculptor. And that is, he mentions Bloodbraid Elf. Now, it is true that back in Standard, when Bloodbraid and Jace the Mind Sculptor were in at the same time, Bloodbraid did keep Jace the Mind Sculptor in check. Now, granted, this was before Stoneforge Mystic had Batter Skull to go and get as well, so it's, not, it's a little apples and oranges, but Bloodbraid Elf comes down with haste and enough power to take out a Jace if you brainstorm the first turn. Also, you could go into, uh, you could cascade into Blightning. So, both of those were power plays that could be used to keep Jace in check. Granted, you had to play uh, Gruul, not called that, well, yeah, it was called that at the time, even though Gruul wasn't in Standard. Uh, but you did have to play those colors, but you could, and it could keep Jace in check. There were some other answers. Elspeth, while not being as good as Jace the Mind Sculptor, could beat Jace the Mind Sculptor in a similar way that Brimoz can beat True Name Nemesis, even though True Name's definitely the better card. If you've never seen that interaction in Legacy before, long story short, uh, Brumaz has enough toughness to survive a True Name Nemesis. Not that it really matters. You can't block the True Name, and if you swing, you're not going to get through anyway, but Brumaz will make a token, and the token can get through, or True Name can eat the token, and three will get through. And this can keep compounding over and over, turn after turn. Elspeth did something similar with Jace. If Jace wanted to get rid of a creature that Elspeth made, Jace had to go down while Elspeth went up. Long story short, there were things, there were cards keeping Jace in check. Bloodbraid Elf was one of those. However, there are a few reasons why Bloodbraid cannot be unbanned. I mean, I, I suppose it technically could, but reasons it is very unlikely to be banned. I would not put it at 1%. For one thing, Jund is already Tier 1. Unban Bloodbraid Elf and you make Jund that much better. Absolutely. If you've seen Legacy Jund, Bloodbraid into Liliana is a thing, and that would happen in Modern. And that seems kind of powerful. That seems like so much value. So that is true, that's one. Also, Ancestral Vision right now is unbanned, and when they unbanned Ancestral Vision, and you don't have to take my word for this, you can uh, look up the article itself that brought up, it was the unbanning announcement uh, for that season. They mentioned Bloodbraid Elf. They said the lack of Bloodbraid Elf, I'm not quoting here, I'm paraphrasing, the lack of Bloodbraid Elf made unbanning Ancestral Vision easier to do. 
which means that if they unban Bloodbraid Elf, I don't see them keeping Ancestral Vision in. There are Cascade decks in Legacy, you know. Bloodbraid into Shardless Agent into Ancestral Vision <laughs> is a thing. Um, so Bloodbraid, based on that alone, on those two, should not come off. Jund is already Tier 1, and Ancestral Vision is legal in the format. I think that Wizards made it pretty clear when they made that unbanning announcement. Bloodbraid or Ancestral, and they chose Ancestral. Now, the reason that they chose Ancestral, one of them anyway, is that they wanted to sort of push blue control, which at the time, and even now, isn't really a thing in modern. There are some control-ish decks, and control is somewhat viable nowadays, especially with Nahiri the Harbinger into Emrakul, so Jeskai control can actually win relatively quickly at this point. That is true. But for the most part, we haven't seen too much blue control, so the argument goes, well, if we unban Jace the Mind Sculptor, then we would give them a win condition that's all the stronger, it might push control over the edge, um, it wouldn't break the game because it doesn't come down early, but it would give them a sense of inevitability. That's the argument, more or less, and that's what he uh, goes into in the article. I disagree with that. Um, for a number, okay, so for a number of reasons. I'm going to counter myself just a little bit to start. Uh, Modern is a turn 4 format. That doesn't mean that your deck is not allowed to win before turn 4. Anyone who plays Modern can tell you, at least from experience, that is not how it works. Decks can win before then. But, if your deck wins before turn 4, you either need to be very inconsistent at it, such as uh, Goryo's Vengeance, Storm, or you need to be interacted with easily, like Infect. Um, I, I guess Burn as well. Uh, Burn's not that much of a turn 3 deck, but it can. Uh, but Infect, for instance, is sort of the king of this uh, rule. Infect needs to be interacted with, and that's why, even though it can kill on turn 2 or 3 fairly consistently, Infect isn't banned, it just is too easy to take out, especially in a format where Lightning Bolt and Path to Exile Actually, I don't think Path is the second most played card anymore, uh, non-land card. I think its spot has been taken, uh, but Lightning Bolt is still the most played non-land card, and Path is up there. Jace the Mind Sculptor, then, would seem to be fine to bring in, right? Especially since there's no Daze or Force of Will or any of the pitch blue cards like that that stall the game extremely well. I think that people underestimate the ability of blue to stall the game for long enough. If you've played uh, an Esper Gifts deck, or um, just Esper Control, if you've played a Control deck that runs Wrath of God, Supreme Verdict, Day of Judgment, Damnation, that's the gift package for Wrath spells that made me think of Esper Gifts, you realize that that kind of deck can actually slow the game down enough to stabilize later on especially against uh, the kind of modern feel which is especially creature heavy nowadays. You're not seeing a lot of Pyromancer Storm running around, for instance. There's not a whole lot of ad nauseum. As such, don't underestimate the ability of the blue deck to stall for long enough that Jace can come down and take over the game. I think that people who haven't played a lot of Legacy may not realize the impact, or maybe, maybe that isn't the problem. Maybe they just see all of these strong, aggressive creatures and, or they see the prevalence of Lightning Bolt and say, well, maybe Jace wouldn't quite be that oppressive. I can see where you're coming from, and that's why I started this by saying I can see where Seth is coming from. I don't think that I would put Jace at 0% to ever be unbanned, but he would be the absolute last resort. Bef I, would, I think this is a better way of putting it. Before they decide to unban Jace the Mind Sculptor, they are going to push blue in standard just because it would be better than reprint than allowing Jace the Mind Sculptor. I think that's the rationale. In other words, we're going to give you your torrential gear hulks. We're going to make Snapcaster easier to get. We're going to give you some new blue tools to work with. Uh, we're going to give you answers against other decks, low to the ground aggressive decks, so on and so forth. Only if none of that works would they consider unbanning Jace the Mind Sculptor. They know how strong that was in Standard. They know how powerful that is in Legacy and Vintage. 
I think that they might even, uh, I don't know who it would be, what department it would be over in Wizards, play test with cards over and over and over again to see whether they can come off the ban list. I'm sure it's not just analytics, it's not just looking at results and saying, well, should this card be banned or unbanned based on the results we see? It's probably also, will this break current decks and will this break what we're going to print later on? Because of course they know what we don't. I'm sorry that that rambled a bit, but what I, the long and short of it, the TLDR is, I think that Jace the Mind Sculptor's inevitability should not be underrated. Jace is too powerful for modern, even if it isn't by an extreme degree. Like, <laughs> perhaps, uh, well, let's get on to Mental Misstep. That's an easy one. Mental Misstep did not blow up standard. That is true. Even when Delver was running around, it didn't blow up standard. Uh, even when Glistener Elf was everywhere, it didn't destroy the format. That is true. It's apples and oranges, though, to compare standard to modern or legacy. We've seen what it did in Legacy, and the reason that it operated that way is because of the extremely strong prevalence of one-drops, and while Standard at the time, again, had Delver and Glistener Elf, for instance, Standard does tend to have a much higher curve than Eternal formats. That's just the nature of the format. Standard tends to be slower, having fewer sets and whatnot. In Legacy, if you didn't run Mental Misstep, you were doing it wrong. <laughs> you were doing it incorrectly. Or you were running, I guess you were running some deck that didn't have any one-drops, like Mud. Even then, probably you were doing it wrong. Uh, every deck had four. Mental Misstep beat Mental Misstep. That was crucial to understand here. That, that's what separates it from a card like Spell Snare, in addition to being a free cast card. It counters itself. Not the, the card itself, it counters other instances of itself. If this were in stand, or it was modern, excuse me, if this were in modern, think of all of the one drops that are around this format. They're ubiquitous. We're talking about all of the really low to the ground creatures in Zoo. We're talking about Noble Hierarch, Glistener Elf, several cards in uh, Affinity. We're talking about just any, so Birds of Paradise as well. We're talking about the entire Elves deck, pretty much. It would destroy a lot of decks to the point where they would have to run Mental Misstep to counter other Mental Missteps. That creates a degenerate format. I don't think that that's what we want. So Mental Misstep, maybe to me, is the second easiest one to say no to. And I can understand Seth's where he's coming from. We've seen what it did in Legacy, but Modern isn't Legacy. That's true. Modern... I don't know if it necessarily has a higher curve than Mo uh, Legacy. That may be right, that may be wrong, but it still has such a presence of one-drops that you can't get away with that. It would utterly change the meta. And I don't think in a very healthy way. If there's any card that you have to jam four into every deck, you're playing Yu-Gi-Oh! Well, I guess in Yu-Gi-Oh! it's three, but you see what I'm saying. Yu-Gi-Oh! doesn't have colors. Yu-Gi-Oh! doesn't have cost in the same way that Magic has it, which does make Yu-Gi-Oh! an interesting game. I rather like Yu-Gi-Oh! Not more than Magic, but I like it, because it gives you that unique experience. But Magic should not be Yu-Gi-Oh! There should not be any card that goes into every deck. Even Vintage doesn't have, other than the Moxon and Black Lotus, doesn't have a card that goes into every deck. And I guess not even then, <laughs> not even in Vintage. That's pretty close, but Dredge doesn't, right? I think. Oh, I hope I'm right. Sorry if I'm wrong. All right, so in any case. <laughs> uh, next we have Chrome Mox. If any card can come off, I think that this is the least unlikely of them. I still don't think it's likely. I still don't want to go there. Let me give personal experience first, this anecdote, if you will. I play Blood Moon. Okay, that's it. That's the entire case. No, no, in all seriousness, it's a bit more than that. Right now, we have Simeon Spirit Guide, and Simeon Spirit Guide is not broken in modern. It sees somewhere in between fringe and stable play. It sees archetype play, I guess you'd say. Simeon Spirit Guide is a very good card. Uh... Simeon Spirit Guide is somewhat kept in check by the fact that it's pretty much the only fast mana 
the only zero mana free mana, wh whatever you'd say. It's the only mox that can be put into any deck. Yes, there's mox opal in Affinity specifically. But because it's the only one, you know, you, you can run the numbers on this, you're not likely to have even one Simeon Spirit Guide in your opening hand of seven cards. Because of that, you aren't likely to build your entire deck based around just one card like it. Imagine if, for instance, Oopsall Spells in Legacy. For those that don't know, Oopsall Spells makes a bunch of fast mana and then casts Balustrade Spy or Undercity Informer, I believe are their names. You have no lands in your deck, hence the name, and you use their effect to mill yourself your entire deck. Now you have eight copies, effectively. You have four of two cards, so eight copies of these. If you only had four, that means you only have a 39.6% chance of having at least one in your opening hand, the way that works. That means that the deck is less likely to pop off. You're actually more likely to not have it in a given hand. And yeah, you could run Street Wraith and Gataxian Probe and Manamorphose to make it easier, and that's true, those will help out. But if you don't have the Balustrade or the Undercity Informer, and you only have the cantrips, you are taking a risk. Um, in other words, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that Simeon's Spirit Guide on its own isn't degenerate. Give Simeon's Spirit Guide another to work with, and now we have a deck that's much more reliable because you're well past that 50% threshold. You're in, in, the, in other words, you're more likely to hit it than not at that point. Now why is this important? Well, you have four Simeon's Spirit Guide, I personally run one Gemstone Caverns. You could run more, but it's legendary, so there's an opportunity cost for each beyond that. And then you'd run four Chrome Mox. And this makes getting out the turn one Blood Moon happen much more readily, turn one or two. And you don't... Uh, Blood Moon is a good card, obviously. It's a great card. But you don't want it to be a format warp warping card. And yes, I hear what you're saying over in the comments section already. If you ran Chrome Mox and Simeon Spirit Guide and Blood Moon, the odds that your deck is going to be doing very much else, they aren't very high, and that's true on that turn. But now that you've dropped the Blood Moon, what's your opponent going to do? If you got it out on turn one or two, you have plenty of time against the vast majority of decks in the format to set up. Even Burn nowadays is often a Naya deck for cards like Atarkas Command, Lightning Helix, Boros Charm. Ooh, it's uh, not where you want to be. Okay, it's not just Blood Moon. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Storm also benefits pretty heavily from Chrome Mox, and this is not something that I've seen myself, uh, or from having played it myself, but if you're familiar with the concept of no ban list modern, if you've seen that before, uh, Storm is extremely powerful in that. And part of the reason is they have access to Chrome Mox. It gives them the fast mana to help them go off much more quickly. Yes, it's true, they also have Ride of Flame, they also have I think, Seething Song, uh, but Chrome Mox is just another tool in the kit, and I don't know if just adding that would push it over the top. Counter-argument, and this is one that Seth Manfield makes. Which is a good point, I'm going to admit. Chrome Mox is different than Simeon Spirit Guide. It's different than uh, Lotus Petal, <laughs> for instance. In that, or even Mox Opal, in that you have to pitch a card. Importantly, you have to pitch a non-artifact, non-land card, which means it doesn't go straight into Affinity, or at least it's very unlikely to, and it means that you're having to two-for-one yourself for that mana. That's true. A lot of decks don't care. Uh, maybe that's a bit too harsh, but Storm, for, let's take Storm, for instance. It is such a redundant deck that pitching the worst card in their hand is often not that big a deal in order to get the turn one Pyromancer's Ascension out, for instance. Just first thing that comes to mind. <sighs> I think Chrome Mox makes it just a bit too far. I've also seen the case, and this isn't something I necessarily agree with, but again, I can see where they're coming from. Modern is already a fast format. If you unban Chrome Mox, you might push the turn 4 rule a bit too far. You might make too many decks able to consistently, and without interaction, just kill you on turn 3, or sooner. 
Maybe. I think we'd be pushing the envelope. I don't know if any would quite make that consistency. But think of Goryo's Vengeance. <laughs> Goryo's Vengeance often has one card they do not care about in their opening hand. Pitch that, Simeon Spirit Guide, land, Faithless Looting, Goryo's Vengeance, go. I, that's not much of an exaggeration. That's not... That's somewhere in between every time and Magical Christmas Land. That can happen. Especially with cards like Street Wraith and Attack Scene Probe, yada yada yada. Okay. I'm on a roll. I'm having fun. I'm sorry, Seth. I don't mean to be harsh on you. I really don't. I'm not like you're watching this. I don't think it's all that likely. But I, I really don't mean to be harsh on you. I'm just trying to give a different perspective. That's all. I, I do actually see where you're coming from, even though I, I don't agree. And I don't think it would be the end of the world on most of these if they were unbanned. I think trying them out wouldn't just automatically kill the format. But I, except for Mental Misstep, I actually do think that that one would. Um, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so a, a little bit harsh, but I mean well. I really do. I like your writing, man. And then next, Umazawa's Jite. Whew! Okay. I'm going to counter myself immediately. It is gusting so hard outside. Well, I'm actually going to run around in it right after I get done recording this. Umazawa's Jite does not have Stoneforge Mystic in the format. That's fine. That's true. If Stoneforge Mystic were allowed, then it would be Demonic Tutor for either Umazawa's Jite or Battery Skull. That cannot happen. Uh, it, in a similar way that Birthing Pod puts a restriction on any creatures that are designed in the future to not break Birthing Pod, Stoneforge Mystic would put a restriction on any equipments that are made to not break Stoneforge Mystic. So we don't want that. Better the Jite to come off than the Stoneforge Mystic, in other words. I still don't think that Jite is quite there yet, though. I, I think it's still a little bit too strong. Modern is an awfully creature-centric format, and Magic in general has been moving more towards creatures as time goes on. This is especially true in Standard, where there's this power shift that's been taking place more and more towards creatures. And it's a, it's a long-term, well, creatures and planeswalkers. It's a long-term trend, but it's happening nonetheless. Umazawa's Jite breaks creature mirrors wide open. You no longer can Jite, you can play Jite to kill another Jite. So whichever one resolves first, that player is extremely likely to win. And spot removal, because it's an equipment, not an aura, isn't even going to be all that big of a deal because the next creature they play, they can equip it to later. Yeah, it'll slow them down, and maybe it'll slow them down enough. But the fact that it persists on the field, at best, I, I see the case. It's a four mana sorcery, that's true, with an investment of two mana in two turns, potentially. And yes, that is slow for modern. But if you can stall the game long enough, have this on any creature, and you just take over the game. The first thing that comes to mind, and this may not be the optimal shell for it, but this is the first that comes to mind. Say that you're playing a Jun deck. Jun has a lot of spot removal and stall in the form of discard. And, uh, and there's Lightning Bolt, Colagon's Command, uh, I guess Sudden Shot, that doesn't really see a lot of... So there's Dismember, I mean, they have spells they can play to stall the game. They also have big creatures. It is not all that unlikely for Jund to... How do you say? For Jund or Zoo to control the board long enough to stick a Jite, equip it, hit, and then they take over the game from there. If it were just about decks either playing the creatures or interacting with the creatures, that might be a different story. But because there are decks that can do both, and do both exceedingly well, I hope I'm making the point clear here, uh, I think that Jite can't really come off. These mid-range decks, it's not even just the fast decks, although those might do it in the case of, say, Bogles, because they can't be interacted with. But these mid-range decks seem to pose perhaps the most problem because they have the creatures that they can put the Jite on, as well as the removal to deal with opposing creatures to which GT could be put on as well. Maybe that makes the format more skill-intensive, or maybe it just grinds it out. And 
becomes a little too oppressive. I don't know. I don't know. I, I have not seen GTA take over no ban list modern. But to the extent that modern is a format of competing fair decks, as I think it's more or less supposed to be because of the turn 4 rule, either relatively slow combo decks, or fair decks, or control decks that can prey on the fair decks. No, no, that's a little bit too... <laughs> even that's a little too specific. <sighs> or control decks that can deal with both of them. We don't see too much control, we don't see too much combo. Magic is very creature-centric right now, and given that, Jite, I think, would push that a little bit too far. But hey, I'm open to being wrong. <laughs> I see you in the comments right now. No, Jace and or Bloodbraid Elf are fine. You know, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. I, I strongly suspect that you're not. I hope I've made the case well that they, would, they should not come off. And Seth, I really appreciate that you play Devil's Advocate on yourself first. You start off your Jace the Mind Sculptor section with, and by the way, I could be wrong, I'm going to make the case against myself first, I'm paraphrasing here. You even do the same thing with the Umazawa's Jite uh, first paragraph. Say, <laughs> nice reference to Break Open, by the way. Uh, he put the link to Break Open the card. Very nice. <sighs> but I, I disagree based on what I've said, and I hope I've made the case well enough. In any case, if you have any suggestions, any comments, any critiques, please let me know. If I get some valuable constructive input, I might even do a follow-up on this video, because I'm sure that I haven't hit every point that could be made. Between Seth and I, I'm sure there's plenty more to go. And maybe you see an angle that I don't. In, in any case, I hope to see you later on. Uh, if you want to see if I do post a follow-up video to this, subscribe to the channel and click that little notification button, and it'll let you know. Thank you very much. I will see you later. Take care, Magic Community. Bye-bye.